This is Victoria's Chinatown. It's the second oldest Chinatown anywhere in North America. 160 years of Chinese immigration to Canada started right here, before BC was even a province. And this is the neighborhood's crown jewel, the gate of harmonious interest. This beautiful arch was built in the 1980s to welcome visitors, a tradition that goes back to the origins of the neighborhood. It was meant to signify a forward-looking Chinatown. The messages inscribed on it promoted a future of integration and harmony within a new wave of Canadian multiculturalism. That sentiment is in stark contrast to the history of Chinatown. For a long time, this place was considered to be a forbidden city, a segregated maze of alleyways, secret passages, and hidden courtyards filled with drugs, brothels, and gambling. It's through arches like these that will step into the past to uncover the origins of Chinatown and to discover how a neighborhood filled with promise eventually became the target of Canada's very first war on drugs. This is Canadiana. In 1788, Irish Captain John Mears landed at Nootka Sound on the west coast of Vancouver Island. He was the first European to establish a settlement in what's now British Columbia, but he wasn't alone. With him were 50 hired Chinese craftsmen. The very first European fort in the Pacific Northwest was built by those Chinese workers. And Nootka Sound was just the beginning. Chinese migrants would continue to colonize the West alongside European settlers, thanks in large part to one thing, gold. 1848, the gold rush begins in California. It doesn't take long for the news to spread across the Pacific. Tens of thousands of Chinese migrants sail to San Francisco to mine for riches. They're greeted with racism, but persevere. A decade later, California has been stripped bare. But word gets out, there's more gold up north in the Fraser River Valley. People from all over the world make a mad dash for British Columbia. Their destination, Victoria, the gateway to the mainland. Overnight, it's transformed from a trading post of just 300 people into a boom town of thousands. A third of the newcomers are Chinese. This time, they're here to stay, and many, many more are on the way. Thousands of Chinese tradespeople, merchants, and laborers will help turn the trading post at Victoria into the economic engine of British Columbia for years to come. Soon, messages were being sent home to China about what they were calling Gumshan, or Gold Mountain. And before long, Ships arrived in James Bay, carrying even more people from southern China. Most were here for the gold, but some were fleeing the Second Opium War for rebellions, or famine, or even just a general lack of opportunity. This place, and BC in general, is gaining a reputation as a promised land. Suddenly, nearly half the population of Victoria was Chinese. Most of them stuck together in one area of town, where a cluster of wooden shacks quickly evolved into a district filled with stores, theaters, temples, and schools. Canada's first Chinatown was born. Soon, companies sprang up selling goods from across the ocean, like rice, sugar, and tea. This block at the corner of government and Pandora became a row of storefronts, and business was good. So good, in fact, that one of them, the Kuang Lee Company, became the second largest business in Victoria, and eventually opened stores all over the mainland competing with the Hudson's Bay Company. The Kuang Lee Company's manager was Li Chong, an English-speaking Chinese man who was among the first to come to Victoria from San Francisco. His wife was actually the first Chinese woman in history to come to Canada. Li and his fellow Chinatown businessmen became de facto community leaders. When they heard representatives of the Crown were coming to town, they wanted to send a message. So they put up the money for a Pai Fang, 
It was common for dignitaries on tours of the country to be greeted by European-style arches. Pai Fangs were part of a Chinese tradition. They marked districts and welcomed visitors. In a show of goodwill, they anglicized some of the banners with lines like God Save the Queen and English Laws Most Liberal. It was a display of cultural fusion, and that was part of the point. From then on, every time a governor general came to Victoria, the community built arches all over Chinatown, and embedded within the decorations was a symbolic statement. Chinatown was a distinct community, but it was loyal to Canada as long as its residents were treated fairly. The problem was, they weren't. In 1871, BC joined Confederation, and that gave the BC government the power to pummel the people of the province with a wave of bigoted legislation. And the fact that Chinese Canadians had booming businesses while being forced to work harder for less made it even worse. Now they were being accused of taking white settlers' jobs. Over the next seven years, laws were passed making it illegal for Chinese Canadians to work as lawyers, doctors, teachers, accountants, pharmacists. Their voting rights were revoked in both federal and provincial elections. And Chinese immigrants were banned from being employed in public works all the way until 1958. The governments of British Columbia and Canada had made their intentions abundantly clear. And then something surprising happened. Suddenly, Sir John A. Macdonald and the federal government seemed to change their tune entirely. They went from trying to suppress the Chinese Canadian community to calling for thousands more Chinese workers to come to Canada. Ships started pulling into port, filled with new arrivals from Hong Kong. It seemed as if Canada was back to being a land of opportunity. And this time, Chinese immigrants were welcomed with employment in a gigantic nation-building project. They were being hired to build a railway to the Rockies. Everything was about to get even worse. The horrific conditions Chinese workers faced, the hundreds of lives lost, it was finally over in 1885. The Canadian Pacific Railway was complete the most difficult portions built solely by the Chinese. The Canadian government owed them big time. But in Parliament, John A. Macdonald was now calling to slow the Chinese immigration he had encouraged. As far as he was concerned, they'd done their job. And now there was a danger the Chinese would take over BC and disrupt what he called the Aryan character of the country with Chinese immorality and eccentricities. So the federal government passed one of the most racist and exclusionary laws the country has ever seen. A head tax on Chinese immigrants introduced the very same year the railway was finished. Five years later, it was doubled. And in 1903, it was increased fivefold. The effect was devastating. The country they had worked so hard to be a part of the country they died for had just slammed the door shut on their futures. But through it all, Chinese Canadians remained resilient. And here, in Victoria's Chinatown, they were still building celebratory arches to welcome governors general, even British royalty. Some of the displays had turned into hidden protests. They made their anger against the government's policies known. But they were also still filled with messages of openness to a country they had long considered their home. But the damage had been done. Something had changed in Chinatown. The bans, the head tax, the recently unemployed railway workers. It was all leading to an epidemic that would throw the nation into a panic. And the center of it all was right down here. This is Fantan Alley. This is the place that gave Victoria's Chinatown its shady reputation. It's actually officially a street, the narrowest street in North America. Today, it's filled with hipster art galleries and boutique shops. But over a century ago, Fantan Alley was known for three things. Brothels, gambling dens, and opium factories. This is where the nearly all-male population of Chinatown came to spend their free time. Both sides of the alley were boarded up, and guards stood looking through peepholes you needed permission to enter this section of the Forbidden City. 
to shadowy dealings drew regular police raids. A lookout would spot them coming and send out a warning. Everyone on the street would drop what they were doing and flee. Opium dens would clear, bars and brothels would vacate, gamblers would grab their money and run. They'd escape through back doors and passages into hidden courtyards and alleyways, leaving an empty street. The police would arrive, finding only the evidence of the crime left behind. Coins, beads, and small buttons from an ancient Chinese game with similarities to roulette. Fantan, the namesake of the alley. You see, gambling was illegal, but the use and manufacture of opium was fine. In fact, both the federal and provincial governments actively encouraged the refinement of opium. Why? Because it made them a ton of money on licensing fees and taxes. After all, the British had forced the opium trade into China from India, then fought a couple of opium wars against China to keep it going, laying the groundwork for opium to be grown and then shipped across the ocean into a British colony turned country. The Kuang Li Company, one of those businesses that had been funding the Ornate Arches, had been on the receiving end of that supply chain since they first opened shop. They had an opium factory here in Fantan Alley for decades, and theirs was just one of more than a dozen in Victoria. Chinatown's merchants didn't just trade in tea and sugar. Victoria was actually the center of the opium trade in all of North America. For years, the city had been the primary exporter of opium to the United States, going as far as to smuggle it in after the drug was made illegal there. The whole operation was a cash cow for everyone involved, but now there was a big problem and it would outweigh the government's greed. That railroad they just had the Chinese workers build was now fully operational. And the opium, which had mostly been harming communities in the West, now had a highway east, straight into the heart of Canada's population. Use and addiction exploded in the rest of Canada. And who took the blame? Chinese Canadians and their Chinatowns. In 1908, the Opium Act, Canada's first ever anti-drug law, came into being after the future Prime Minister, a young William Lyon Mackenzie King, visited opium dealers in BC and was horrified. The number of white opium addicts was growing. Fantan Alley reacted by becoming even seedier. A black market had emerged. Chinatown was about to enter a long period of decay and truly be treated as a forbidden city. The city of Victoria, which had lost its economic power over the region to Vancouver, rejected Chinatown entirely. They decided to project a new genteel and ultra-British persona in order to attract what they saw as more favorable visitors. And the crown jewel was this, the Empress Hotel. It was built by the Canadian Pacific Railway, the very same Canadian Pacific Railway that hundreds of Chinese Canadians had died working for. It was completed the same year the Opium Act was passed. The message was clear. Chinese Canadians were no longer welcome in the city they'd helped to build. One last time, an arch was built to celebrate the visit of a governor general in 1912. But this time, the arch was placed outside Chinatown, here at Yates Street. It was bright and modern, and in gigantic letters, front and center, was the word welcome. But once again, that message was ignored. It wasn't long before the infamous Chinese Exclusion Act would ban Chinese immigration to Canada entirely for 24 years. The Chinese Canadian community never gave up though, and they never left. They kept fighting for their rights, and eventually the racist laws were overturned. But for the next 70 years, not a single new arch was built in Chinatown. That is, until the gate of harmonious interest in 1981. More than 100 years after the first arch was built, through a century filled with some of the most racist policies the Canadian government has ever enacted against its own citizens, the message has remained constant. This Chinatown is, and always has been, striving for harmony between cultures. Today, it's a thriving district, 
It's a national historic site and one of the most popular tourist attractions in Victoria. The Forbidden City is a thing of the past. But down the alleyways and the side streets, behind the storefronts and in the courtyards, is the memory of the Chinese immigrants who first came to this place, who persevered through everything the government threw at them to help build the Canadian West into what it is today. The attacks on Chinese Canadian culture weren't just coming from a few politicians in Ottawa. There was a widespread campaign of hate and its leaders included some pretty famous people you might not expect. I'll tell you more about them in a second. But first, I want to thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to see more incredible stories from the history of Canada, please click subscribe. We're incredibly thrilled to have been able to come 4,000 kilometers or something all the way to Victoria to tell this story, and we'd like to keep going. But to do that, we'll need your help. You can become a patron on Patreon, or just give us a one-time donation on PayPal. Every little bit helps. You can also follow us on social media at This Is Canadiana. Now, back to those famous bigots I was talking about. One of them was Emily Murphy. She's one of the most famous Canadian feminists ever. She's actually one of the famous five who have statues on Parliament Hill in Ottawa. She spent her life fighting for women's rights, but also fought against Chinese Canadians. In fact, she wrote an entire book blaming them for Canada's drug problem. Another one of those famous bigots had a more direct tie to the city of Victoria. The famous British author Rudyard Kipling loved this place, but hated the Chinese Canadians in it. He wrote some of the most vilely racist things you will ever read in your entire life and called for the mass extermination of all Chinese people. There's actually a lot to both of those stories, so we're going to tell you even more about them in a couple of future editions of Canadiana Shorts. You can look out for those by subscribing on YouTube or following us on social media at This Is Canadiana. I'm Adam Munch, and we'll see you next time on Canadiana.